10 let the strange tides roll. And he floated. 4 am on the bayou. A gentle breeze. The islands that dot the waters are like many jungles. I wish you could see the colors change on the water. I wish you could be here. Be here now. See the colors change, gently changing. Such deep rich tones, you couldn't dream of. And the dark dignified silhouettes of the palms covered in vines, going by on either side. And the sounds of the birds. The birds. Out on the bayou. They submit their frantic salutations to the dawn. Down those twilight halls of water, dawn strides to its coronation. The waters swept very languidly along. And it seemed that he would flow forever, there in the savage tranquility of that place. He saw shores with ferns, plantain trees, rushes, cypress, flowers of subtropical splendor, and then like a dream, like they had simply disappeared, he saw only water, water of a deep electric color that was deep beyond dreams, savage and tranquil beyond dreams. He was wet, very wet. And he saw the trees, the palm, the cypress, the plantains, the vines, he saw them tower up in state. They were greeting their Lord Don, who comes every morning, for eternity. The landscape was eternal in a special sense, not in that it never changed it changed often but in that it was eternal. These islands and flows were eternal representatives of the Don Empire. An empire that spanned eternity. Barry was agog to have the honor of paying witness to its renewed coronation ceremony. Did the papers know yet? Someone alert the press. He floated. The birds were flying, they were swooping, they paid no more notice of Barry than if he was an old food wrapper from the city. The city must be fairly far behind now. Barry had gotten some kind of a current. He adjusted his grip on his life-giving chunk of buoyant calcified trash. A gator sunned itself on a nearby island. Gators, those long-lived creatures, children of the bayou. The water flowed, it flowed, and somehow Barry didn't get tired of holding the buoy. It was like grabbing the sheets when you slept. But this was no cozy sleep. Barry should have been more than uncomfortable. But he felt he was engaged in an important pursuit. He was floating. He needed to see this floating to the end. But if the end, if the flow, went out to sea eventually, that would not be so good. Yet he didn't think so. The city wasn't far from the sea, but he was seeing many islands he seemed to be going further into the bayou. And he didn't see much of an alternative. He wasn't planning on living the rest of his life on one of these islands. If the flow changed course and went out to sea, it would be hard to determine when. If the islands stopped, he guessed he'd know then. It would be a horrible end. But would it help, even then, to fight against the current? Or would it just tire him out? This current seemed strong enough, though meandering. He wasn't sure how easy it would be to even get to a nearby island. As if in response to his thoughts, he suddenly rammed into a sandbank. He climbed up to a sitting position, still clutching his calcified trash lightly. It was a lovely little spot, with small bright wildflowers and ferns of all sorts. And it was a fairly wide island, perhaps indicating that the flow had only brought him closer to land. His flow-addled brain couldn't reason for too long at a time. He was wetter than he had ever thought possible. Tired? He was tired, yes, you could. Say that. It was fair to say so. He snorted, the diseased air of the city displaced by the healthy air of morning, the transfer leaving his sinuses feeling raw. A warm bath was like a far-flung fantasy, too lavish to dare entertaining. Knowing where one was, was a luxury, in this world he'd been flung into. None of these things was a preoccupation to him. Because they belonged to a different world. Here, he was solely occupied with continuing his travels. Forward. All else was a momentary apparition of the mind. A short way down the shore, a gigantic crane looked out over the water. It was poised on its slender legs with the effortless grace only a crane can have. Behind it, a gator crept up, 
eyeing the biggest meal it had ever seen. Suddenly, the gator began its charge. And without breaking complete calm, the crane turned and, from under its oversized wingspan, pulled out two of the biggest, most over-muscled arms Barry had ever seen. They were pure white, with powerful hard-edged fists the size of Barry's head. The gator stopped, then ran in the opposite direction. And the crane turned its attention to Barry. Barry pulled himself up with a groan. Listen, you stupid son of a bitch, he said as the bird sauntered coolly his way. I have no desire to fight you. But I'm on a mission. And I'm not letting you, or anybody else, delay me any longer. So you wanna show me what a bayou crane is made of at five in the morning? Fine. You're about to find out that decisions have consequences. Barry cracked his knuckles. It's go time. Tziak spoke to Morgo over flat generic brand beers. I come from a different place. But it's not in our interest to share our background information. Suffice to say and I'm not telling. A picture containing text, book. Description automatically generated. You anything you couldn't figure out with a little effort we love puzzles and games. And we love it when there's stakes. We love games, but not for the reasons you might think. If you win a game fair and square, with exceptional skill, you just demonstrated that you spent way too much time on a game. That's it. We love it when skill breaks itself down from the inside. We love beginner's luck. We love it when people build up lazy assumptions about a game they format their identity around, and those assumptions short-circuit their ability to deal with significant new challenges. What we love is chaos forged from out of order, because it's the most chaotic kind. We're assholes, in your language. And you're going to have a descendant that can do all that with an incredibly fixed game. How can you game the system in wrestling? I don't know, Morgo said. You can't do it by any normal means. Wrestlers have all different skill levels, but the ability to get through the door is dependent on weight. If you don't weigh much, it's not an option. Boxing has welterweight. You think anybody cares about welterweight wrestling? Get real. But there's always a way to game the system. And that is. The details are complicated. The thing I'll tell you today, though, is that to do something like this, your descendant has to be a scholar. To a scholar, anything is possible. How can you know this? My good woman. It may seem like I'm pulling this out of my ass. But we know about scholars. You have to know about scholars in our game. Or else they'll know about you. The left hook connected with Barry's face, crunching bone. He backed up. The crane floated. He thought back. He thought. Nothing. There was no strategy to deal with an opponent this light and nimble, that packed this much of a wallop. A scholar can do anything. His ears sang. In the name of all that is holy. Order of the mystical scholars of knighthood, send your blessings. Finklin, give me your agility, your stamina. And it struck Barry, just as he was struck in the gut by a right hook. He was thinking in terms of factors, factors that were limiting his strategic possibilities and making his movements predictable. It was time to throw a spanner in the works. He narrowly avoided an uppercut that might have finished him. And he jumped. It seemed an absurd idea. The crane would have complete aerial superiority. But Barry jumped, and he grabbed a plantain. And he squeezed the plantain in just the right way, so that the meat of it pooped out and flew through the air. It splatted into the crane's eyes. In that crucial second, Barry let loose a gravity-defying downward sloping dropkick. Feathers flew. The bird slammed into the ground in a white-hot motion blur. Sand flew in all directions. The creature lay in a smoking impact crater, heavy arms limp at its sides. Barry walked over, exhausted, to where he'd left his calcified trash. He waded back into the water. And he kept floating. You want me to curse my descendant with the life of a warrior. He will elevate the lineage. 
How can I trust you? You can't. But why do I need to tell you anything? It's not like I need your permission. I just wanted to get your take on it. But you do want something from me. You want me to encourage him. Yeah, but he'll be a warrior whether you do or not. So what's your point in being here? Ask yourself this, dear woman what's my point in doing anything? Barry floated. Eleven something in the air. The land became greater. The trees became scraggly. Barry walked along the shore. He finished eating the last of the crab, threw the shell away. He preferred eating vegetarian. But here, now, that meant starvation. So he finished the crab, he ate the whole crab, he kept walking. He stank. He was incredibly sandy all over. His beard was already bounteous. It itched like the devil. The shore was covered with grey dunes that went and went and went. He had some idea that those dunes would take him towards the southwest. So he turned from the ocean, and began walking through the dunes. And stopped. As he crested a particularly high dune, he saw something from the corner of his eye. Something to the south, still far away. He squinted. The sand hay seemed heavier around here. But he couldn't be mistaken. Out by the sea, the spectral outlines of a boardwalk lay themselves against oceanic grey eternity. An oblong ghost at the very extremity, on the doorstep of nothingness, must represent a ferris wheel. This was something not to be passed up. Out here, in the midst of nowhere, he might find a link to a road by which to navigate. If Fortuna, that unspeakable abomination, crawling chaos at the center of the universe, was munificent, he might find a mode of transportation. But more even than these, the prospect of an amusement area brought the prospect of opportunity to make some creds. He was penniless. He could discover the cheapest hotel and it would do him no good indentured servitude for passing travelers at such places was something that only happened in fiction, usually cheap genre fiction, which Barry despised as ungentlemanly and often racist, sexist, and anti Kia plus. But even if some such a thing was possible, Barry didn't have that time to waste it actually made more sense to continue on foot. Finding a paying wrestling venue was his best bet for procuring some legal tender. Here along the coast, he doubted they would even have word of the T-Town Caravan, a group of nobodies to the rest of the world, who'd probably never come within 50 miles of whatever Hazyburg this was. But if it was even connected in some way to a more happening hub, it was entirely possible he could get word on Jazzy Jayhawk's activities though he hated to think of meeting the man himself without an Andirene sample handy. There were things that he had to show M. Dr. Jayhawk, that he couldn't just tell. His brain revived, jolted back into action, Barry strode along the beach towards the boardwalk in the dirty grey mists. Deep in thought, he passed a large wooden sign. It read City Limits Galvanite. A few figures, ghostly from a distance, more and more alive as they drew nearer, strolled about in the plain late afternoon light. The planks underfoot, though not so rotten as to appear dangerous, nonetheless showed their wear. The attractions had an outdated, poorly cared for appearance that was not the result of a calculated attempt to convey quaintness. This boardwalk had seen better days. Standing conspicuous at the entrance, Barry scanned. Though well past its prime, it clearly had a loyal following. An amusement destination fully on the way out should see almost nobody at this off time, in a haze that made sea viewing less than ideal for the typical mind. Though the gathering was modest, it was visible, and not without a degree of enthusiasm. Something kept people here, for now at least, some memory or sentimental nostalgia. And something kept people manning the booths there was always someone for that. It was the blessing and the curse. The blessing and the curse. Barry strolled. There were a few midway type stalls, like the shooting gallery and the thing where you hit the big button with the hammer. He walked, scanning for anything that looked like a fighting ring. A cluster of people were gathered towards the south side. It seemed that whatever was in the small ring over there was a larger attraction, at this time of day,
than almost anything else. He sauntered over. One of the combatants was a pot-bellied fellow in a generic wrestler mask and black shorts, who demonstrated by the book white bread technique. A competent slot filler. The other. Barry could hardly believe his eyes. The bronzed brown into reddish skin in that little yellow speedo was more than just muscle. It was a work of supreme art. A lithe waist sashayed to and fro across the arena with confidence and grace, legs stepping like a muscular gazelle. Firm thighs dared you to look closer. Powerfully compact, lean ABS twisted about with delicacy. His movements were unmistakable, unmistakably exquisite. The barrel chest exuded manly in an aura like big bright neon letters, so strong, so lean it was impossible. And the arms. Well. It was a class act. Those arms were suitable for wrestling any foe. Big, lean, graceful, they were like a perfect summation of the whole package rolled into one. Seeing him move was always breathtaking. But what was most surprising was the head. Instead of the square jaw one might expect, the real head not a mask but the actual head of a dachshund sat, with snout resting comfortably, on the chest, turned slightly to one side, pointed bravely at the foe. His ears flopped adorably, just adorably. Big black soulful eyes sized you up, while the wet snout was using advanced smell techniques to get a better profile of the opponent than any normal fighter could. And atop the head, jaunty, his signature a floppy lemon yellow beach hat. Perfect fashion. This was the legendary wrestler, Drip Dry Eyes. What was he doing here? Barry hadn't followed wrestling very closely before meeting up with Tobias that fateful day and talking of M. Dr. Jayhawk. But you'd have to have been living under a rock, to not have heard of Drip Dry Eyes. One of the icons of the industry, his projects in film and advertising were camp staples. Barry knew the warrior wasn't supposed to be in his prime. But to be performing in a tubid place like this, with fodder fighters, he could hardly stand it. The filler guy was trying to try, putting on his best textbook moves, but with the lack of enthusiasm of the consciously outmatched. Drip Dry was politely allowing his opponent to have his time, without relish, without passion for the demonstration for the art. A sense of obligation. Finally, when he judged his dance partner was flagging, he brought him down with an anticlimactically perfect clothesline. The audience clapped, delighted to get such an unasked for demonstration on a lazy Sunday at the boardwalk, tickled to see the guy who did those old dog. Warning, empty page. Treat commercials. Nobody had the disrespect to say anything within earshot like snap into a buddy biscuit, or any of his other old mottos, and while a couple of old fans went up for autographs, everyone gave Drip Dry a respectful amount of breathing room. Barry marched right up to him. Mr. Eyes. I don't mean to bother you, but I'm a wrestler with the T-Town Posse. We're a minor group. You haven't heard any word on them, have you? I got separated from the group in an accident. Word on Jazzy Jayhawk would also be helpful. What was your name? Drip Dry licked his snout. I apologize. Barry. Barry of T-Town. Any help would be beyond appreciated. I also could use leads on where to perform for money, but I realize in a joint like this. Oh. You wanna fight? Drip Dry sniffed. I smell promise. Come back in two hours. The next show starts. I'd love to see what you're made of, kid. Just two hours? It would be an honor. Then I'll see you then. We can talk afterwards. The smell of corn dogs made Barry's mouth water so much that he had to walk well away from the boardwalk while waiting. He scanned about for muscles that might have washed up. But soon he forgot his hunger, that crab had been pretty good after all, he was fortunate to have anything in this situation, and looked out into the grey mists. The indefinite seascape was like a pure reflection of his mind. As above, so below, and as without, so within. This was not as definite. A rule as novices might think. It was handy nonetheless. 
he looked. Bury, he thought. Bury yourself in mists. And he did so. What was he looking for? A fellow scholar to compare notes with? He couldn't wait for that. But he felt that perhaps there was something, something deep, deep down, that had been tugging at him. Get a change of scenery. What a petty phrase. Is this what the world, the cosmos, the infinite mansions of perception could be broken down into, simply a variety of different scenery? All the world, best aged. And then the performer took a final bow, and perhaps they would do a repeat performance tomorrow night. Or perhaps their career would level up, the next performance being a more lead role. But in the end, it was always a one-person play. And eventually, they would reach a point where they could end their illustrious career, go into retirement. Then what? Retirement sounded boring to the youthful. But Barry was hardly youthful. Youth had come and gone, like a phantom in the night. And now he was looking into the grey haze like a guy in a commercial for a smooth jazz compilation, and he was feeling more connection to the legendary drip dry eyes by the minute, even though he knew next to nothing about the guy, even though he, Barry, was no legend. Never had been. He was just a normal tea town guy who liked to go on walks, and did a little alchemy on the side. An amateur even in alchemy. But a skilled amateur, he knew. And pretty darn good in mycology. He peered into the haze. Did drip dry eyes wish for such a life of humble anonymity? The boardwalk's ornate little clock tower told a quarter to. It was time to head up there. Time to see what the legendary warrior had in store, and perhaps, if luck be a lady, cipher what had got into him to make his career stall this much, that he should end up out here, so far from the halls of glory. Barry would not impose on the good man. He was already giving. Barry the privilege of his time. But he would endeavor to get to the bottom of it, to see if there were anything he could do to help, however little. He had to. The crowd was maybe twice the size of before. This was roughly reflected by a general increase in foot traffic all along the boardwalk. Now, there was a diminutive ref watching the proceedings. He held up his arm. Drip dry seemed calm and relaxed, but alert. This was the training Barry needed. He would have to give it his all win or lose, he was the one coming out ahead in this deal, and he was prepared to capitalize on it. The ref's arm dropped. Drip dry came straight at Barry, elegantly and perfectly closing off avenues of movement with his exact placement, in perfect SYNK with Barry's own. He seemed to know where Barry was thinking of going, and respond to it, before Barry made the first twitch of movement. They circled one another. Barry applied himself to being patient. Drip dry would have an ironclad defense. He might not let his guard down for any amount of time. But he was putting on a show at this boardwalk. He didn't have much to lose at such a place, but he would likely not want to allow the match to drag, simply out of courtesy to his viewers. Barry, on the other hand, had nothing whatever to lose, except perhaps a sterling opportunity for defensive training such as he was getting at this very minute. So he circled, looking with razor-sharp hawk eyes for any opening. And Drip Dry did the same. The dynamic tension weighed down on the audience like a beached storm a cloud. A few minutes passed. It was plain Drip Dry was in no major hurry. Barry was in none whatsoever. Another minute. Both men began to perspire under the unnecessarily bright floodlights that had now come on in the grey evening. And still circling, circling. Drip dry. Fainted. Barry didn't respond. Again drip dry fainted, again Barry failed to respond. Circling. Circling. Drip dry stepped back, leaned casually on the ropes. Barry came in cautiously. Then it all happened. Well if nothing you do makes sense, Morgo said, why should I listen to you? Because I brought pot brownies. They were watching Shark Week. It had been playing on regular rotation for the last 500 years. As Morgo lounged, 
she reflected that it felt like she'd been watching it that long. Morgo was a tall woman, with angular, handsome features, and the head of a dachshund. She organized potlucks and gaming events for all dogface people. Dogface people had to stick together. Society was against them. She'd met Tziak at a gaming night. He was way too obsessed with fighting games. She didn't like him that much. But he did make the best pot brownies. Okay, well what do you want me to do, she asked, lounging further. You will have an heir one day. Buy him wrestling action figures. Put wrestling on TV. Buy him a wrestling game or two. And that's it. That's all that's needed to establish the greatest wrestling dynasty of all time. I don't see the connection to gaming the system. Why create the greatest wrestling dynasty? Because I love wrestling. Tziak took a sip from his long neck. The mighty fist moved with the speed and inevitability of a meteor. It hit like one too. Barry was just able to react by an inch, so that while the heavy blow still hit him full on in the face, it didn't break his nose. He had fallen into the trap. But he wasn't out of options. In a split second, before even Drip Dry had time to react, Barry struck a counter blow on the side of his muzzle, knocking his head sharply to the side. The two fighters leapt back, staggered. It was a race to see who could regain their balance first. Suddenly, Drip Dry bounced off the ropes. The slipstream from the clothesline almost knocked Barry down by itself, like being right by an airplane during takeoff. He had dodged it by a hair's breadth, almost by chance in his still imbalanced state. If it had connected, it would have been over already. Drip Dry was turned around already. This was one of his signatures doing clotheslines with immense stopping power and momentum, but still somehow being able to pivot right out of them. Barry went in for the blow. His fist wouldn't have drip dry strength, even a drip dry past his prime and facing a lull in his storied career, at least not without months of further training. Additionally, drip dry always used his oblong head to his advantage, since this made a narrower target. Stomach punches had a hard time getting through due to his incredible ABS, and hits to the chest were like punching a sturdy wall maybe you'd get somewhere, maybe, if you had a sledgehammer. For Barry, it was head blows or nothing. But Barry had his own tricks. Barry swung for the left side of Drip Dry's face. Drip Dry blocked with the left hand and brought his right fist in for a MATC handing mega blow. The meteor that was his fist was now on fire and tumbling. It had its own gravity field, its own zip code. It came of Barry's head like a jawbreaking battering ram. And Barry leaned his head, neck and shoulders back, over, down, behind his back, without moving anything else below, like a man made of putty. The deadly fist zoomed by, an inch above his crazily contorted form. At the same time, Barry's arm went around and to the other side of Drip Dry's head like a fleshy whip. He grabbed Drip Dry's snout with a vice-like grip, proceeding to yank him around by the nose. Then, with the other fist, Barry pounded Drip Dry right between the eyes. Drip Dry's hands closed in, but Barry had already dodge rolled away. Drip Dry was disoriented. But not completely off his balance. He closed in, quickly entering grappling range. The two men locked grips and began circling, pushing to and fro, testing one another's arm strength. The audience was stunned silent by how much of a matchup they were getting on the galvanite boardwalk on a regular night. This was an unusual situation, a once-in-a-lifetime stumble upon. Even in the heat of battle, it struck Barry that he had fought in the Chrome Dome arena and encountered nothing to speak of, whereas he came upon a no-name boardwalk in the middle of nowhere and was fighting a legend. But no time for reflection. Now, Drip Dry was slowly but surely getting the upper hand. Barry planted his feet and, in desperation, tried to metalize his back and arms into position. It was an uphill battle, trying to do all that and still paying attention to Drip Dry's movements. The ropes weren't far from Barry's back. Drip Dry's grip was ever tighter. 
The foes were now locked in place. Barry had it. He had it. He focused all his energy and attention, communing with his energy points. Then, in an abrupt shift, he began jogging to the other side of the ring letting his arms trail behind like twin streamers of taffy. Drip Dry began to apply pressure to his limp grip, hoping to crush his foe's hands. Just in time, they slipped out of Drip Dry's grip, more liquid than solid. With immense concentration, Barry brought his arms and hands splocking back into place as if winding back a yo-yo. At almost the same instant, he hopped up onto the middle of the ropes, with the grace of a crane. Drip Dry, seeing Barry's position, charged. Taking a deep breath, Barry entered that timeless realm within the breath itself. His face ached like he'd never felt. His hands felt like they'd gone through a ringer. All his joints and nerves were frayed and worn. His mind buzzed with the stimulus. He closed off panic, impatience, querulousness. This was the now time. If he couldn't act now, how could he justify his designation as a mystical scholar of knighthood? Drip dry barreled in ultras low motion, and Barry saw a glint in his eyes, as of a hunger reawakened. He could not let him down. He fought one. Bringing forth fresh reserves, he smoothed his nerves with a bolt of mind energy down the spine, took crane-like flight off the ropes and illusionistically displaced himself in two dimensions. One folk, term used by alchemists denoting a unique, meditative state of intense concentration, unavailable to an uninitiated mind. Derived from the Latin focus meaning hearth, fireplace in this context a point of light upon which meditation is trained. Not to be confused with the English focus, deriving from 17th century scientific Latin, referring to the point upon which a ray of light is trained. The dropkick showed platonic form. But what did that matter? Stopping and planting his feet without missing a beat, Drip Dry held his arms out, prepared to grab Barry from the air and send him flying. A desperate move indeed, to drop kick like this and so clearly aiming straight at his head. Beginners are all the same. It never occurred to Drip Dry that Barry might have illusionistically displaced himself in two dimensions, because with that strategy, the only other place close enough for the real image to aim for would be the chest. But this is exactly what Barry was planning. The illusionistic displacement faded as Drip Dry's hand went through its ankle. At the same instant, a drop kick like the free fall of an archangel from heaven struck Drip Dry squarely between the pecs. A seismic wave reverberated. For a moment, Barry's feet seemed to freeze on Drip Dry's chest, like some titan that had just made landfall from a thousand abysses of space onto some massive rocky world. A sound like a thousand giant drums pounding one simultaneous beat erupted from Drip Dry's chest at the impact point. The air seemed to pause to catch its breath. At the end of the boardwalk, seagulls took flight. Then, time jerked back on, and Barry dropped. Drip Dry stood there. Barry Dodge rolled to a safe distance, eyeing his canny foe. Drip Dry moved. He should feel minimal effects, and indeed he was still up and ready to finish the fight. But he was less steady on his feet. What did this kid have behind that kick of his? Few had ever even attempted a drop kick on his chest. But of those who had, they were at least twice this kid's weight, were seasoned pros, and were doing it after Drip Dry had taken much more than the minimal punishment only two solid hits than he'd taken just now. And in those instances, he'd felt almost nothing. But now, there was no denying it. He felt off balance somehow. He closed in on Barry. Barry strafed, dodge rolled, barely avoided getting grabbed. Drip Dry closed in again. Again, Barry strafed, dodge rolled, barely avoided getting grabbed. And then, with lightning speed, Barry hit Drip Dry's chest with his fist, slightly below where he'd kicked. It was then that Drip Dry began to understand the level of Barry's mastery over pressure points. The hit had almost no impact. But now, Drip Dry found himself jittering up and down, up and down, like his feet were on tiny and super-fast bouncy springs. 
he couldn't see properly. Barry dodged rolled behind him. Barry grabbed both Drip Dry's shoulders with both his hands and began running backwards. His arms stretched across the ring. The crowd, beginning to come out of their shock, was making noise. Barry rolled his arms back in, and the mighty form of Drip Dry fell onto his back like a thousand-year oak. On the instant, Barry leapt across the ring and onto Drip Dry's prone form. The ref counted. Drip Dry had the strength to get up. He moved his legs. He couldn't get purchase. They were too shaky, still jittering and bobbing. They scampered across the mat without staying. The ref was counting steadily, a real pro a second was a second, no funny business with drawing the time out. Drip Dry was so thankful for that. He moved his mighty arms. His fingers gripped the kid's back and jittered all around like he was playing a harp. Drip Dry let out a long Simon. This was the pits. And this evening's winner and new champ of old Galvanite Boardwalk what was that name oh yeah Barry. The little ref patted Barry with upraised arm, in a good-naturedly embarrassed replacement for holding up his hand. Barry suspected that being champion of old Galvanite Boardwalk was an informal honor. But he was ecstatic. The audience was giddy with the thrill of a truly once-in-a-lifetime event of right place, right time proportions. Two ladies hooked into the evening air. A fellow cried out, Saints be praised. There was almost frantic milling about as groups put their combined conversational efforts in trying to piece together what they had just seen. The air was lightened, as after a thunderstorm, when powerful electricity has been recently discharged. Barry and the ref combined to help Drip Dry, still wobbling slightly, to his feet. Drip Dry turned to Barry. Friend, you're not only getting first-time performer pay of 20 creds from the Galvanite Tourism Bureau for that. You're also getting dinner on me. 12 pick a card, any card. Behind the rinky dink town of Galvanite, there was a quiet desperation. The small town showed signs of a distant period of expansion. Many of the old, worn structures were from a time when it must have looked like the place was destined to grow to at least medium size. Though not of the unfathomable vintage of Neozo, the oldest structures were venerably ancient. But where that crow-infested city had had an aura of timeless moldering vice that seemed to reach down through time's gulfs to mask the stink of day drinking with its lugubrious glamour, the storefronts facing the water in Galvanite merely stank of the nights of paranoia and tartar sauce they'd paid witness to. And where the decrepit structures of Neozo seemed never to have dreamt of anything beyond their dark brooding, in the company of their empire of pests and of the harlots whose business practice involved glamorizing themselves and their surroundings for the venerable old houses of Galvanite, it was quite different. Barry only got a peek of them in the fading light. But the impression was confirmed later when he viewed them up close, and was further cemented, the more he saw. These stately old two-story townhousey apparitions dreamt ceaselessly of the respectable future they never had. There was nobody there to glamorize their gables, to defend their dormers. Old and lonely, they were far from eternal and they were saddened, bitter with the thought of the future ahead, wherein they would rot even further. The dreams of Neozo were made to molder, they were at home in moldering. Those dreams thought that they were the hard asses. Edgelord dreams. But those dreams didn't even know what it was like to be lost. They never had anything to gain what was there to lose. Only the stately old houses of a far-flung place like Galvanite truly knew how, with time, one could find oneself lost in one's own home. Yet Galvanite was far from abandoned. The boardwalk had given a faithful idea of the condition of habitation for the whole city. There were a fair number of people in the little town, some residents, some passing through, though it seemed the town was on the way to nothing and out of the way of everything. It was certainly no port destination. That misplaced nostalgia, that strange sentimentality kept just enough folks around for just long enough but it was a nostalgia obscure, something nobody spoke of, or for that matter, could really identify if asked. The grey sky darkening quickly, Barry strolled with drip dry eyes to a little low-lit Italian bistro. The seafood is mostly fried around here, 
he said. Oh don't worry, Barry replied, I just came from a place with great seafood. I'm ready for some spaghetti. As the two got seated at a little table by the window, he started to give Drip Dry an overview of his journeys. Drip Dry listened attentively. Barry reflected that his haggard appearance must have seemed strange and questionable. The whole thing was unorthodox, and with only him narrating it uncorroborated, probably seemed unreliable. It all felt like a distant dream to Barry, anyway. There are many rough eons in this world we live in, said Drip Dry wistfully. It's fortunate that you escaped with your life. Thank you. But tell me, Amis, what's brought you to the town of Galvanite? If it's not too presumptuous of me to inquire. My dear boy. You're well within the realms of ordinary conversation. Well, if I told everything, it would bore you to death. I don't know how familiar you are with wrestling history, of its ups and downs. Very little, I'm afraid. It was about ten years ago that I was last considered national champion. But don't put much stock in that. The governing bodies have no really effective way of knowing who the best wrestler in the United States is at a given time. I did manage to defeat a young, less experienced Jazzy Jayhawk a crowning achievement. But he came back at me full force, and later matches went his way. Even so, I looked forward to them eagerly, and cherished their memories. It's true that none have shown more professionalism in the ring or out of it, I dare say. Oh. Barry turned pale suddenly. Drip dry eyes, please, please forgive me for the transgression I am about to commit, the vile temptation I will succumb to. Cut to the chase, man. Come on. I'm not just talking about your career records or whatever poppycock wrestling fanatics will pour over. To no one's ultimate benefit. What I mean to say is that, in full view of my alchemical tricks and the edge they can give me, I shouldn't have been able to beat you this evening. Never has a victory been so simultaneously euphoric and melancholy. Instance after instance after instance, oh, you were on the very brink of taking me down, and I dodged through out of good fortune more than anything. But it's plain that you have the ability within you, to have closed those instances, and the match, out in your favor. Yet you haven't the gusto, the joie de vivre. It's not in your motions, which, however masterful, feel wrote. I've only seen a few instances of you in your prime a statement which surely marks me out as a wrestling outsider, a veritable philistine to then be criticizing you in any way, and after you've treated me with boundless generosity. But good sir. Less than eight years ago, you were a shining beacon of clean living. Nobody could mistake it. Drip dry eyes held up a hand. My passionate lad. Never apologize for trying to help a fellow man. You touch me at every turn. But what we're dealing with, in my life story, is more than even you have any concept of. Know that there are things that even your alchemy cannot. Touch on. I'm not referring exclusively to matters of the heart, though that is included. I have been through turmoil. We all must own up to our regrets. They spotted the discreet waiter with their plates Barry steaming spaghetti, drip dry eyes ample cacciatura. Barry slurped his noodles, drip dry lapped up some bell peppers. Looking at each other, they laughed. How easily, drip dry said, the mind of the warrior is distracted. They got some ample bites in, and drip dry continued between tooth snaps. I've been through divorce all right. A wife of seven years, do you think she even looked back? No, I shan't allow myself to be too hard on that confused girl. What's done is done. But though it beggars belief, divorce is the least of the strange and horrible journeys I've been on, well out of the public eye. And they've left me drained. Before this evening, I thought I wouldn't feel certain valuable emotions ever again. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It was eight years ago that my that Paganina, my wife through my most successful years, left abruptly. There are some things you never get over. I can hardly speak of it to this day. Of course, it was all over the papers. How could it not have been, 
At that time, I was still in the limelight, even if that light had already started to wane a development which I welcomed. You may not know that within the dogface community, there's rare but notable friction between the majority, normal humans with simple dog-like faces, and us in the minority, who have the full head. I think it's totally silly. The thing is, by becoming such a big shot wrestler, I was perceived by some as having sold out to the establishment. To think that in the ancient days, the nation was rocked by protests over things like police brutality against minorities, and now we politicized something so silly. How far we've fallen, as a species, from the golden age. I have royal blood. There shouldn't be such a thing in our community, but there is somehow. People were saying I was part of the establishment. I would have left. But after the divorce, I had time to reflect. In a way. I in a way I'm thankful. It gave me a new perspective, refreshed my mind. And I realized that, ridiculous as it may have been to call me a part of the establishment, I had, in a sense, let myself be penetrated, mentally if not spiritually, by it. In what sense, or senses, do you suppose this was, asked Barry. A good question. Well, when we deal with a group of people, we tend to adapt their mannerisms. It makes things easier, more efficient, makes one more comprehensible to others. But it can also let their perspective, even their way of life, seep in, a little bit. We have all felt the relief at leaving a group and thinking, I'll never have to mentally adjust myself to that again. This was something like what I felt at this time. But I was still making money off those dog biscuit ads which, in case you were thinking of asking, they tasted okay I prefer other snacks to dog biscuits, but I'll eat some if they're there. The point is that I was under contract for a couple more years. Plus I still had a misguided attachment to some pasta chains I was trying to make work, it was a ridiculous idea, they had no personality. The gist is, I was still tethered to the establishment. And it was affecting my lust for the glory of battle. It was polluting my view of being a warrior, making me into a cynic who held to the misguided notion, sitting unexamined in my mind, that royalty checks were the goal of all these feats of strength and prowess. I spent more time out in the desert. I knew something was wrong with me, but I hadn't identified what. But I felt a spiritual longing. It's a feeling that hasn't left me, though I failed to come up with any answers. One day in the desert, I met a strange fellow. He may have been a heat hallucination. But what he said disturbed me. He said he was fond of games, and of finding weaknesses in systems. He said that dog boys organized crime was even now turning my three remaining pasta joints into fronts to sell dope to teens. He said that Paganina, no, I can do this, he said that she needed to have time to herself, to grow more exactly like I had been trying to do. Sigh. He said that organized crime gangsters would besmirch my good name, and to ever get back at the scum suckers, I would need to discover a tag team partner once spoken of in Prophesy, a legendary warrior who, with my help and the help of others, would usher in a mighty time. I'm curious, inquired Barry. This odd fellow. Was he a short, stout praying mantis, with red complexion and baleful, glowing red eyes. How on earth did you know that? Oh, just a lucky guess. Pray continue. Saints preserve. Well, this spalpine gave me the galloping willies. But I walked back and didn't think much more of it. Then, a week later, I got the news from one of my boys. Rogue bad apples within the dog boys were using the supply line of the stores as a link in the chain set up to sell dope to kids. Those filthy scum sucking pieces of shit, mused Barry. Exactly. In every way, I thought, these gangsters are filthy, scum sucking pieces of shit. They're worse than paparazzi. They're messing up the bodies and minds of kids. I knew I had to do whatever I could. But, as the old saying goes, real life ain't the movies. 
I couldn't just go single-handedly give the entire bad crew a beatdown, with a good talking to at the end, telling them to eat their fruits and veggies and never sell dope again. I had a problem with some of the dog boy staff. My plan A was to take that problem to upper management. Plan B was to lawyer up. I had hardly gathered a legal team, when I found unexpected use for it. The owners of the individual restaurants were ganging up, claiming they had been coerced and charging me personally with negligent oversight. It was looking like the legal royal rumble of the century. I was certain the chain owner rats had accepted bribes and were now trying to cover their asses. But you can't make a case on unproven allegations. Meanwhile, divorce settlement payments were bleeding me dry faster than any amount of royalty checks could mitigate. I was walking around, doing groceries, washing clothes, trying to stay grounded repeating to myself, don't get desperate, don't get desperate, don't get desperate. I met with the chapter head of the dog boys where I lived in Arizona. A guy named Phil. Tarnation. Are you psychic, boy? You alchemists must be more powerful than I realized. He was a big fellow, who loved playing cards. We threw a few decks. Drip dry sniffed in the underground dimness. The wide, low lounge smelled of easygoing secrets. It smelled of conspiring spalpeens. It smelled of mildew. No surprise that. There were no customers. There were never any customers in such joints. But this was supposed to be the headquarters of the legitimate dog boys for most of the Southwest. Drip Dry smiled. Legitimate indeed. What did that mean here? What was legitimacy to such an organization? What did the dog boys even do? They described themselves as a fraternal organization. A polite way of telling outsiders to mind their own business. Good gracious. Drip dry eyes hated fraternal organizations. Behind the drab brown counter of the bar, an ordinary barkeep without a trace of dog face features stood, hands behind back. Drip dry walked towards the bar, his nerves frayed, joints stiff from the tension he had been undergoing. What was the point of this nonsense? Even though he was the victim of bad luck, of a conspiracy, sometimes he felt he was doing it all to himself. But such feelings tended to make things worse without offering solutions. What should he do, join a religious cult? He had to take things one day at a time. I'm here to speak to your boss. And you are. Don't sass me, boy. The barkeep walked into a back room without further comment. A moment later, out came Phil, moving lugubriously in his rainbow suspenders. Drip dry, it's good to see you, he said easily. He moved to grab a glistening bottle of scotch. You still don't drink? Drip dry nodded. Phil snatched the bottle with a flourish of the wrist. Let's sit. He indicated a table in a dark corner, walking out from behind the counter. On the center of the table, was a deck of cards. The two men walked to it, sat. They eyed one another. Phil unscrewed his whiskey bottle. It was completely full. Drip dry eyes watched. Phil. He continued to say nothing. His face impassive, his eyes did not blink, did not move from philosophy Phil brought the bottle to his flabby, grinning lips. Like a hawk, drip dry watched. Phil began to gulp. He gulped the drink down. Drip dry watched. Phil gulped. He gulped. His Adam's apple bobbed with the steady glugging, his beady eyes peering over the bottle at drip dry, smile lingering as he drank. Drip dry watched. Phil gulped. He gulped. He gulped. Drip Dry saw that Phil was halfway finished with the bottle. Phil gulped and gulped and gulped. Neither men's expressions changed. Neither men blinked. Phil gulped. He was three quarters finished with his bottle of whiskey, the shiny bottle that was formerly completely full, unopened, as far as Drip Dry could tell, untampered with. Phil gulped. There was no moderation in his gulping. Drip Dry breathed easefully and steadily through his nose. Phil gulped. 
he gulped. Phil was completely finished with the consumption of the bottle, that bottle of whiskey that was once full and shiny, that bottle that was now empty, and less shiny for its lack of more than the slightest residue of that shiny alcoholic liquid that had once dominated its interior with impunity, in the time before it was set upon by the prodigious thirst of philosophy Phil no longer gulped. Neither man blinked. You could end up in the ER that way, said Drip Dry, in no way varying his steady gaze and placid expression. Phil brought the now empty bottle to rest on the table, to the side. His eyes twinkled. His smile twinkled. Phil now reached across the table. He was reaching for the deck, a deck of cards. It occurred to Drip Dry that these were tarot cards. I see that your game is tarot cards, he said. Ain't it yours, said Philosophy Drip Dry failed to respond. Phil began to shuffle the cards. He shuffled. 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 And he shuffled. And once more, for good measure, Phil shuffled the tarot cards. He shuffled. At this time, Phil fanned out the cards. The expressions of the two men were unchanging. Pick a card, Phil said with a slight upward inclination of his chin. Any card. Drip dry eyes reached his hand across the table. While at no time taking Phil out of his steely, hawk-like gaze, Drip dry took his mighty brazen-hued hand a hand of legend and with thumb and forefinger, elegantly plucked a card. He lay it down. It was reversed chariot, Major Arcana 7. Oh Natural, said Phil. This is the past, said Drip Dry Eyes. I have yet to draw my card for the future. I wouldn't even think of trying to pull one on you, said Phil. Drip Dry reached. With the same grace and delicacy of his mighty digits, he plucked another card and lay it down. It was upright strength, Major Arcana 8. Somehow, Phil said, I can't imagine you ever drawing anything but Major Arcana. Drip Dry looked at Phil with a steely, hawkeyed gaze. It was the same gaze. Thank you for your time today, Phil. I wanted to talk to you about the harmful actions inflicted on me, and the kids, by some boys claiming to be your boys. Are they your boys, Phil? Because we have a problem on our hands here. And please don't think that you can avoid it. This is your problem just as much as it is mine. Damn straight it is, said Phil. So what's up? No expressions changed. No gazes wavered. Suddenly, there was a loud rumbling from up above. Oh no, muttered Phil, not this shit again. The rumbling continued. Drippy old boy, Phil said more loudly with a show of good cheer. I think we may have a house guest that will explain things better to you than I ever could. Care to join me in the upstairs dance hall, old chap? I'll be watching you like a hawk." Phil chortled. Oh, I dare say it. 